Welcome to this Youth Research Dialogue, which is the second episode of our thematic online series of evidence-based youth research findings. My name is Carmen. I'm the project manager and coordinator for the European Research Network Ray uh, here at the Finnish National Agency for Education. And together with our great team, which is Tomi Kilakoski, our moderator, Domagoj Moric, our digital facilitator, and Andreas Kasten from the Ray Transnational Research Team. We prepared this second youth research dialogue today for you. And we were also very happy um, to have our guest speaker, Margareta Gregorovic, on board uh, for this second uh, youth research dialogue. She is a Ray researcher for Croatia. Croatia. You will hear about uh, uh, more about her a bit later. Yes, so um, what is the topic of this uh, of this youth research dialogue? Uh, seven insights from seven years of research. Therefore, we will take a closer look at the impact of the Erasmus Plus youth program today. The RAIN network has conducted surveys um, on the impact of the program since 2009, starting uh, with the so-called standard surveys. And this continued then with the research project um, RAIMON, that's the approbation for uh, pro a research project on evidence-based analysis and monitoring of Erasmus Plus youth. Yeah, shortly said, the aim of this uh, research project is to explore the effects and the outcomes of the Youth in Action program, or now the Erasmus Youth program, to contrib contribute to uh, the practice development, but also, of course, to improve the implementation of the program and to develop it further. These studies, uh, these RAIN monitoring studies, uh, were and will be still implemented in cooperation with all our Ray partner countries, which are currently 32 European countries. Uh, from the research uh, design, um, some information. Uh, these are online multilingual surveys in 29 languages, and they were conducted on a regular basis approximately every second year in the last program period, which means from 2014 to 2020. Uh, and these surveys um, or these questionnaires are sent to actors and beneficiaries which are involved or which were involved in projects uh, funded by the Erasmus Plus Youth in Action program. Yeah, some interesting numbers, uh, more than 63,000 project participants and more than 13,000 project leaders, team members have actually participated or yeah, fully responded to this service in the time frame from 2014 to 2020. So quite a, quite a high number, quite an impressive number. In this episode, you will get the insights from the past seven years uh, and some food for thought, not only from our transnational research, but also, as already said before, uh, you will hear a country perspective from one of our Ray partner countries from Croatia. Yeah, more from Tommy in a second. From my side, thank you for joining today. Uh, check out our Ray website and also the Ray social media pages for any updates. Enjoy, and now to you, Tommy. Hello all and welcome to our Youth Research Dialogue. My name is Tomi Kielakoski. I work as a youth researcher uh, at the Finnish Youth Research Network. Today we will be talking about Erasmus Plus Youth Programs. Erasmus Program started in 1987 and the scope of the program has since then widened considerably. Uh, today the aim of the Erasmus Plus Plus program is to support through lifelong learning the educational, professional, and personal development of people in education, training, youth, and sports in Europe and beyond. 
Uh, today we will hear seven insights from seven years of examining European youth programs. Now, number seven has a magical aura. For example, there are seven days in a week, there are seven cardinal sins and cardinal virtues, and there are numerous pieces of art using number seven, such as seven samurais by Akira Kurosawa. Moreover, Rudolf Steiner believed that human growth happens in the period of seven years. According to him, first seven years are a period of maturation and of uh, losing the baby teeth. Given this growth, it is only fitting that they are looking today back of what has been learned in the seven years of research on Erasmus Plus programs. Before I give the floor to our speaker, I would like to remind, remind you uh, about a couple of things. Firstly, our dialogue will be recorded and edited video will be available later on the internet. So if you want to check back or maybe recommend it to your friends, it's possible to do that. Also, uh, we will be following you live. So please comment on the discussions and presentations and do ask questions. You can post questions either on Facebook chat or on Mentimeter and the code will be the code, code is, is displayed on the screen at the moment. So our first speaker today is Andreas Karsten, who is a member of a transnational research team of the Ray Network. Andreas works, works for Youth Policy Labs, a small research agency and think tank in the youth sector. Uh, Andreas leads an international team of, of participatory research, public policy and open data aficionados who work on a transnational, transnational research with the RAIN network. Andreas will be providing seven insights from seven years of transnational RAIN research on Erasmus Plus Youth in Action programs. Go ahead, Andreas, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Tommy, and uh, welcome to everyone. Um, I find it uh, very satisfying that I'm starting this uh, short presentation in the seventh minute of this research dialogue. So let's dive right in. Um, seven insights from seven years of research. Um, insight uh, one is also the most important one, um, is very simply that the program actually works and works very well. You heard it from Carmen, we have surveyed more than 63,000 project participants, more than 13,000 members of project teams, and the insight is unequivocal. The program uh, works well, it manages to achieve its main objectives, its aims, its uh, targets, its ambitions very, very well. Um, it is, um, for example, intercultural learning at its best, one of its core functions. Um, so one of the things that we ask project participants is how much they appreciate cultural diversity more than they did before the project. And you see the numbers from our last two survey rounds here on the screen. So two thirds of project participants say we appreciate cultural diversity more than before the project. The remaining ones by majority say it's the same than before. Um, the program is also non-formal education at its best. Um, project participants understand better the concept of non-formal education and learning. They learn more about how to foster um, a non-formal learning in youth work. Um, and again here with very, very impressive numbers, 90.3% um, um, in both of these cases combined strongly agree and agree. Um, so that's uh, really uh, quite fantastic. Another core element of the program is um, its youth work at its best. Uh, project participants learn something that they intend to use in their work with young people. Um, they learn better how to deal with unexpected situations in educational activities with young people. Again, quite um, impressive numbers. But then, of course, uh, we conduct monitoring and assessment of the program on an ongoing basis to understand better where we can improve the functioning of the program. And the remaining insights are about um, those areas for improvement that we have seen emerge um, or persist during the past seven years. So the first one um, is around media literacy. Uh, media literacy is an area where the opinion of project teams and project leaders, how well um, they develop participant skills on uh, dealing with media, producing media content, um, has increased over time. But the assessment of project participants has basically stayed at a lower level and that discrepancy between project teams and project participants has grown over time. So um, project teams on average think 
they do this better than project participants actually say. And this discrepancy is uh, something that we need to address in this uh, new program generation that just started. Um, the third insight is a very similar one uh, around political literacy. And that's one that's been very persistent for the previous program generation, even the one before that. And something we have discussed in the youth sector for a really long time um, is uh, discussing political topics seriously is something that the program wants project participants to learn more about. And again, there is a discrepancy between how well project teams think they do this and how well project participants think this is being done. Again, an area that needs work in the future. Um, the fourth insight um, is uh, definitely a new one. Um, namely that environmental awareness and also the environmental youth movement has arrived in the program. And that's good news. It's good news that the program is open to that and that the environmental youth movement and climate movement actually considers the program something worthwhile doing. But then at the same time, it is also something that the program needs to start asking with more sincerity, how can we make the program greener in actuality and in practice uh, once we roll out of um, the pandemic circumstances we are in at the moment. The fifth insight um, have to do with uh, the dialogue between policy and practice and youth work and youth research, something else we talk about a lot in our field. Um, and at large, really, policymakers remain a mystery. There are more and more projects that want to involve policymakers um, on purpose and by design. There's a whole action strand, um, youth dialogue, structured dialogue that is designed with that purpose in mind. But largely, policymakers remain absent or remain involved to a degree that we are all not satisfied with um, across the program. And the question is really unresolved and unanswered what the problem is here. Is it that we don't address policymakers correctly? Is it that policymakers are not interested enough or not informed enough? What who is doing what wrong? Um, we at the moment don't yet know. And that's an area that um, we need to do further research on, but also especially improve the program on. The sixth insight um, has to do with digitalization. Um, so you see here the uh, outcome of a question we have asked in surveys around the corona pandemic and the impact of it on youth work in Europe. And we have asked organizations how much of their youth work they have been able to transfer online under these extraordinary circumstances. And you see here that um, more than half have transferred up to a third or less um, of their work online. And that is a function of um, uh, the youth sector having avoided digitalization to a large extent, except a small avant-garde in the past years. And we have not really been able to answer the question of what makes non-formal education and youth work better and different online when everything else is also online. And that question is an open one that we need to address and address quickly. And then the seventh insight um, and the last one uh, for today um, is uh, around recovery. You see here um, our question uh, in, uh, in our work around the corona pandemic's effects on youth work. 74% um, of organizations say the uh, pandemic has affected them majorly. Um, and very, very few organizations are in the lucky position to say that it has affected them only slightly or not at all. Um, and um, the, the kind of impact this has on staff, on volunteers, on finances, on budgets are so sincere across Europe um, that we know already now that youth work will need dedicated uh, recovery support. And this is also a function of uh, the way the programs have been designed largely in the past, namely um, functioning through project funding and project funding almost exclusively uh, giving um, organizations doing international youth work very little chance of building up structural funding, building up resources, building up an infrastructure that can uh, weather um, circumstances like the ones that we see um, at the moment. Now, of course, you can imagine we have 70 insights if we want to, but we were asked to limit ourselves to seven. So that's my seven. And I look forward to uh, Margarita's insights and then our discussion. Uh, back to you, Tommy. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Sevenfold, for your seven insights. Ne our next speaker, Margareta Gregorovic, is a research associate at the Institute for Migration and Ethnic Studies in Zagreb. 
She has been a Ray researcher for Croatia since 2016. She has over 17 years of experience in international research with a specific focus on social inequalities and vulnerable groups of young people. Using Croatian example, Margareta will be discussing the seven year shift in the effects of Erasmus plus youth on the project leaders and participants. Go ahead, Margareta. Hello to everyone and thank you for this great opportunity to be able to present the national context and experience of seven years of Ray research in Croatia. Uh, in this presentation, I will shortly focus on the significant changes which have been recorded between all three cycles in which Croatia has participated in. So on the next slide, you can see that uh, Croatia joined the Ray team in 2015, and she participated in, in three cycles of Ray monitoring research. And over 4,000 participants participated in this uh, research. It's almost 4,500 participants. And those are the Erasmus Plus projects uh, which Croatia either sent, hosted, or, or funded. Uh, some general insights from the from the results. We can say that uh, both group of sur uh, survey participants, both project participants and project leaders, acquired new knowledge and especially in the field of youth and youth work, cultural diversity, non-formal and informal education, and personal development. Also, projects projects have met the goal of promoting active citizenship among young people and in particular their participation in civil society. And here I can also confirm the, the results which Andreas also says that is mostly the appreciation of cultural differences and desire to be involved in activities that include combating discrimination, intolerance, xenophobia and racism. Uh, all in all, projects met uh, the expectations and aims and uh, all stakeholders who participated in the survey confirmed these this, this results. So, uh, as I said, the, the main thing I will, I will focus here are the significant changes, significant shifts between three cycles of research in Croatia. And for project leaders, there are quite a few and less significant differences than for project participants, as you will see in, in a moment. So project leaders, uh, on, uh, just please get, get back one, one slide, please. Uh, they, they, on average, agree more that uh, there is more support to recognition and non-formal formal and informal learning in 2019. And also the project leaders believe that uh, job chances for project participants as the effect of Erasmus Plus have decreased in 2019 in comparison to 2017. On the next slide, you can see that uh, the administrative and project management and implementation has been well evaluated by project, project leaders and they mostly on average per perceive that Project management has improved over the years, especially if we compare the cycles 2019 and 2015. And also during the implementation of the project, the cooperation between partners worked a bit well, more well in 2019 in comparison to 2017 and 2015. Further on, uh, the significant changes in project participants, on the next slide please, uh, it can be noticed that they have improved abilities which relate to discussion, develop, development ideas, uh, thinking logically, drawing conclusion, expressing creatively and artistically a bit more in 2019 than it was in 2015. Uh, further on, the estimated impacts and effects of Erasmus Plus projects have uh, showed that um, there is a um, slight more disagreement that project participants were able to establish contacts with people from other countries which were good for and useful for their involvement in social and political issues in their youth work and professional development. 
and the reasons to that I will be discussing a bit later. On the other side, the actively contributing to, to environmental issues has been, has been, has been, uh, has been the issue that uh, participants agree a bit more in, in 2019 than, than in previous cycles. Further on, as uh, it can be seen for involvement in projects, uh, project participants perceive that they were on, av on average more able to contribute their views and ideas to project development and project implementation than, for instance, in cycle from 2015. And finally, uh, there is a great difference in the uh, addressing the importance of values between 2015 cycle and 2019, and especially these these values, as you as you can see on, on the screen. So there is a large shift in attaching importance to all of these values in 2019 in comparison to the results which will be reported which have been reported in 2015 so uh, what what do, do all of these things results what can what can this mean um, this great deal of significant difference which relates to positive effect of e plus program on values perception and activities in the field of active citizenship uh, while the effects on personal development and obtained competencies stayed pretty much the same, the values have been addressed with greater importance than in previous cycles. One of the reasons could be the launch of European Solidarity Corps program, which puts an emphasis on strengthening the universal values and shifts the focus from the individuals and their competence development on the contribution and participation in local community. Many participants of E-plus projects also were at the same time involved in EC program, which in turn could have affected these general views. Uh, further on, the effects of COVID-19 pandemics could be discussed based on smaller samples of project participants and project leaders, which were included in this last Raymond survey. And also these effects could also be noted in significantly lower average contact established with people from other countries, which is understandable if the projects, projects have not been conducted due to the, the pandemic. And finally, the issue which bothers me as a sociologist is related to the use methodology of survey. And this is to, to what extent could we believe that the answers which have been provided by participants really reflect their activities and actions. There are the ideas, are these ideas put to practice with a significant impact on a wider surrounding, such as local community. So these are some issues which, which could use maybe more attention in, in further research. So thank you. Thank you, Andres, and thank you, Margareta. Before we start the dialogical part, which lasts for 15 minutes, I would remind I would like to remind the audience to, you know, to ask questions, to comment, and we will take on the questions if there if there are. There's only one comment by Isa, which we will tackle later on. Andreas, Margareta provided us with the Croatian perspective. Now, uh, are there national differences how this whole program works, and uh, how does Croatia stand out? compared to other European countries? Um, yeah, well, there are national differences, um, of course, but usually we refrain from comparing different countries in our program and network, um, simply because to contextualize these differences then would mean you'd have to look at how youth work functions. Is it actually structurally funded in a country? Um, is youth work a recognized profession and all of these things? So um, uh, Croatia is not particularly um, uh, complicated or different than the rest of the programs in uh, in our network at all. Um, and something that I think we see in particular European-wide is this shift of project participants and project teams' emphasis on universal values and societal change and societal action. 
and away from personal development and personal achievement. So it was very cool to see that because it was one of the many insights that I left away in my presentation, having to choose for only seven. Um, so I'd rather say uh, what, what we've seen and heard from Margarita is very much also a European perspective. Margareta, both you and Andres highlighted the important message that Erasmus Plus succeeds in meeting the goals of the program. Andres identified uh, some key findings that, that may need to improve on. Do, based on your Croatian perspective, do you agree with him on the challenges identified? Uh, well, yes. Uh, I mean, in terms of, of media literacy and political literacy, these are these are some points which need to be improved in the in the future projects. And the results of Croatian respondents also indicate that uh, when it comes to skills, uh, they have developed to a lesser extent uh, the use of smartphones, tablets, laptops, computers, internet during the projects. And project leaders also felt that they have not improved the ability to independently create content using the different media. And also regarding the political literacy, I think it's also the weak spot for the, from the Croatian perspective as well, because besides those I mentioned, appreciating cultural diversity and desire to participate in combat against discrimination, uh, all other actions which included active, 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 active citizenship uh, were not touched by project. So the, the project did not have any impact on all of those activities. And also in, in, in the field of participation in political and democratic life, life uh, there was a recorded ne negative effect of project. Well, this was a really small proportion of, of respondents, but, but hmm. also it, it is there. So maybe these results could also relate to a problem of reaching the policymakers. I don't know, in, in, at least in the aspect of active negotiation by young people themselves or in, in youth and policy dialogues to, to try to work on this a bit more. This is something Aisa commented on Facebook. She wrote that it's very, uh, it's very important to talk about uh, how to address policymakers. And she wrote that it, it seems to be a missing piece in the puzzle of Jufberg, really having an impact when supporting young people and addressing key issues for them uh, that they want that they want to actually see changed. Now, Margaret already provided some uh, some ideas how to how to improve Erasmus program, uh, and of course it's about connecting the program to wider uh, political, local, or maybe national settings. Uh, do you agree on these ideas, Andreas? And do you have some other other ways to improve that uh, that element in, a, in Erasmus Plus youth programs. I mean, you know, I could I could now play the role of um, the researcher and say, well, uh, no, uh, we point out what's going wrong, and then it's part of a wider discussion, of course, to figure out how to resolve that or how to change that. Um, but one of the things that we really see around the issue of policymakers and their involvement is that very often we consider them only as a target group for dissemination. And very rarely do we find good ways in the program yet, at least, and with exceptions, of course. Um, but on the large scale across Europe, we don't find very many good ways of involving them from the start in meaningful ways. And policymakers don't seem to respond very kindly or very um, proactively to being the recipient of information about youth work projects only. Um, so what that suggests to us from everything that we see at the moment is we need to find better ways of working more closely and more proactively with uh, policymakers. Um, but we'll have to see really what future experimentation around that issue brings. This is a question to both of you. One of the things that strikes me in the presentations is, is the fact that, well, usually when you are studying young people and adults that are working with young people, at some point you are going to, you know, going to end up analyzing differences in understanding how the situation works. Uh, Andreas, presented, Andreas in his presentation showed that there are, when you're looking at project leaders and project participants, project leaders are highly more optimistic about, about how to, how how the participants learn political literacy and also media literacy. Uh, 
are there other, other such differences between within these groups, project leaders and project participants that we know of? Who, Margarita, do you have anything from the Croatian perspective on that? Well, um, I can say that on the first sign, uh, these assessments are pretty much overlapping. So the more importance that uh, issues which were put by project leaders are also, also emphasized by project participants. And uh, for example, project leaders believe that the project participants are more skilled in learning and that they got better with people from other cultures than the project participants themselves. But these are all the, the statement level comparisons, which I, by my opinion, could take much more time to analyze specifically and to, to compare them than in general, by my opinion, they're, they pretty much overlap in their assessments. So Andreas. Yeah, and I have maybe one where the difference exists, but it's uh, the other way around. So uh, project teams and project leaders tend to be relatively skeptical about the applicability and the power and usefulness of YouthPass, the certification mm -hmm. instrument that the program uses. But program participants are on average much more optimistic and much more positive about the uh, support that they receive through getting such a youth pass for employing, applying for internships, applying for jobs, getting an entry into uh, the job market if they are in the transition from education to employment. So that's one where the discrepancy exists the other way around, where project teams are more skeptical than project participants. Great, we have a lot of questions, so we will take some of the audience questions. There's a question in Mentimeter about uh, how the program uh, has provided well enough support for blended and virtual youth work. And uh, according to, to the person who posed the question, the resource for digitalization would, would be an important stimulus. So is there enough in the program that supports the use of digital tools in youth work? Unfortunately not. I mean, that's really an area where we can't even you know, we can't be ambiguous about this. The program has been very bad at supporting uh, virtual and blended um, formats uh, in the past. There have been a few experimentations around um, virtual use exchanges that haven't gone very far. Um, and um, now during the pandemic, even some decisions have been taken that event formats that are switched over to digital formats um, only receive a small percentage of the flat fees that are foreseen for uh, physical formats. Um, so all in all, really, the opposite has been true, that the program has so far, unfortunately, been very bad at supporting virtual blended um, formats um, in, in, its, uh, in its past incarnation and let's hope that changes to the better in the new program generation. Do you want to comment on this, Margareta, or do we take another question? Well, I think we can take on another question, so the audience is in focus. It's a question for you. Uh, you talk about maybe using alternative methodologies, so uh, there's a question for you. What alternative methodology would you suggest? Well, it's 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 really well, it's a tough question. In the sociology, we have different methodologies, but this 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 type of action measuring would would imply, I think, mixed methodology, which would also include different stakeholders, not only the participants themselves, but also some form of representatives of local communities and some that who could use. These, these results in a useful useful way and also you you know you have different kinds of uh, participation and uh, monitoring which could be also used but aside from the methodology itself uh, more much more and uh, personal level interviews focus groups and the methods like this to go a bit deeper into into the problems and these issues so one and of the things I, I also know, I'm sorry, I also know that Ray also has other studies which are also aiming to, to and target indeed these this, this problems. So maybe in, in further research dialogues also we should focus on, on these results. 
So uh, Erasmus program, obviously, it's about individual learning and fostering uh, personal experiences and so on, and learning and reflecting about them. And another element is supporting organization and through organizations, supporting local communities. Uh, what was in it for NGOs, in your, in your opinion? If there's an NGO representative here who, who thinks about joining the program, what, what would you say to him or her? What would be the main steps in, uh, in, uh, in deciding whether to go to the program or not? Oh, wow, that, no, that's, uh, that's like 500 questions in one. Um, first of all, let me repeat our first insight. The program works and it works very well. So if you're here from an NGO thinking about organizing intercultural learning, non formal education, youth work activities in a European setting, this is your program, go for it. There's no question about it. Um, never mind um, that the application process can be cumbersome. It was one of the questions uh, also from the audience, whether we ask about that. Yes, we do. And no, the numbers are not fantastic and there's definitely room for improvement there. Um, but still, um, the hassle is worth it. Um, it's also worth it, though, to think about how you can work around some of the weaknesses of the program. One of the weaknesses of the program is, for example, that most of the time uh, participants go to activities on their own as individuals. And one aspect that would make the program much, much stronger for NGOs and networks and teams is if two or three people from the same organization could attend in particular training activities. Um, and um, but go for it. No, no, no hesitation. Not not for one second. We are approaching the end of our dialogue, but I would still like to pose one question for both of you, and maybe Margaret, if you if you will start. One of the key questions in, in youth work is the question of inclusion. Do we offer enough services for young people with fewer uh, opportunities? So in your opinion, how well are young people with fewer op opportunities able to join the program? And is there something we could do better for them? Uh, well, I think, uh, well, the, the project leaders do report that the people with fewer opportunities have been included in their projects and also around one fifth of project participants in the life cycle for creation results uh, stated that they, they faced some obstacles that they, they, they estimate their opportunities as somewhat or much worse than their, their peers. And those were mostly the obstacles uh, which were related to economic constraints, lack of financial resources, remote living, and uh, living in suburban areas and similar. So maybe uh, these obstacles can also create the, an obstacle in retrieving information on programs and projects in which they could participate in. So it's especially important to approach the problem from the perspective of these young people, people, we often tend to get the perspective from the theoretical level, which uh, often may uh, lead to imposition of some solutions, which on the other side, this, they could not be perceived uh, by beneficiaries themselves as the most appropriate. So maybe to take the uh, position of beneficiaries themselves and uh, Young, young people with fewer opportunities in um, trying to tackle with, this, with these issues. So. And Andreas, you will have the last words before we wrap it up. <laughs> Oof. Um, so the program is actually very good at including young people with fewer mm -hmm. opportunities once they make it into the program. That's something mm -hmm. quite extraordinary that the learning outcomes of young people with fewer opportunities are actually more or less the same. Um, as everyone else's, which in educational settings is actually not a given. It's often the other way around. If you start from a better starting point, usually your end result, your learning outcome is better. And the program levels that. That's really super cool and something we should be enormously proud of. But getting young people into the program, young people with few opportunities into the program remains one of the biggest challenges that the program has. And to support making that better, getting 
better at that and learning more about why that is. We actually do start a research program on who is missing from the program and why, which um, is uh, called, um, not surprisingly uh, for anyone who knows us and knows our abbreviations, is called REMIS. Um, so we'll hopefully know uh, soon more about that and can support um, the stakeholders of the program and getting better at that. Thank you, Margareta, and thank you, Andreas. There would have been a lot of questions, and a lot of the questions had been asked that we weren't able to answer. But we promise to you that we will tackle those questions on our Facebook page. So uh, please do read that again, so we will, uh, have, we will have more, di more discussions. But we have to end our dialogue here. So this was our second Rayu Research Dialogue. More episodes will follow this year. And we will most prob probably continue with the next one at, at the end of October. And please check out Ray website uh, and, and social media pages for updates. And we welcome you to join us again when we are discussing new youth research and youth policy issues. We were talking about seven insights from seven years. In his book, Seven Years in Tibet, Heinrich Harrer wrote, all our dreams begin in youth. And to me, that is a really good reminder on how important it is to support young people. We do hope to see Erasmus program succeed in the future as well, and we do hope to see you in October. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>